Faulkner, and we're listening to the Happy Hippie Jesus Show with Bill and Jeremy. Hey, welcome to the show, Bailey. How are you doing today? I'm good. How are y'all? Good. Uh, good. Yeah. Jeremy, uh, do you have a question for Bailey to start out? I do. Me and Bill have a disagreement. He thinks Jesus is a hippie, and I think it's just him. So what do you think? Is Jesus a hippie or not? Well, I guess it all kind of goes back to what is our definition of hippie. So I'm going to go with what my definition of hippie is. And when I think of a hippie, I think of someone who is not uh, very traditional, like has long hair, um, is a, a very kind person that cares about about the environment and cares about others. And um, that term like came out of the, the 60s movement, and it was a youth movement. So for me, I kind of lean towards, yes, I think that Jesus— um, is a hippie because Jesus loves everyone and radically shows love. So you say Jesus is a hippie. All right, that that's two, <laughs> two now. Two guests have said that Jesus was a hippie. Yeah. <laughs> I'm picking the next guest. <laughs> I'm going to screen them. <laughs> <laughs> Can you give us the elevator pitch of what Ozark Mission Project is for our listeners that don't know. Absolutely. Ozark Mission Project is the absolute best mission opportunity um, that we offer our youth, I think, in the whole entire country. Um, It's an opportunity for kids to come from all over, not just in Arkansas, but all over the country to our state, um, to 13 different locations during the summer. And they do things like build wheelchair ramps, they paint houses, they do yard work for low-income families and people in need. But what they're really doing at camp, which is the most exciting thing, is they're building relationships. They're building relationships with each other. Um, They're building relationships with um, people who are different from them. And they're growing in their faith in um, a a radical way. Like the kids that come to OMP, I can tell you that they will not leave the same way. I mean, their their hearts are open and um, they it's it's a neat transformational experience to witness. That's really cool. Can you give me a story or a specific example of how OMP has changed someone's faith? Absolutely. Um, so we have kids and adults that go to OMP. It's not it's not just a, a kids mission camp. And what I have found is the parents that end up going with their youth um, have something exciting that happens to them too. But um, the story that always sticks out in my mind one of our one of the kids came from a homeless shelter in Little Rock and. He came to OMP um, and he was a little nervous because he didn't come with a youth group and he he didn't really know what he was getting into. And um, at the end of the week, I sat down with a with that little boy and he looked at me and he said, I had no idea what it was like to be on the other end of helping. I said, what do you mean? And he said, well, you know, my mom is a single mom and we've hopped from homeless shelter to homeless shelter and we um, just haven't had that good of a situation and being able to come to OMP and help others, the feeling that I have is just, I can't even put it into words. And he said, you know, I never really had a relationship with Jesus, and I didn't know a lot about Jesus. And now that I've come to camp and I've been able to help, I have a relationship with Jesus for the first time. And I mean, that's huge. And that happens over and over again, not just with, um, you know, kids that uh, are not um, in a church home, but even kids from our own congregations that go, um, they just they get to experience Jesus in a different way and their faith in a different way. Now, I know you also have a lot of college student involvement uh-huh. uh, in OMP uh, that the, the camps I've gone to almost seem to be the majority of the leadership are college students. Can you talk a little bit about uh, the college involvement uh, in OMP? Because that's a little bit different than what the uh, junior high and high school kids uh, right. experience. Right. We we actually hire you know around twenty or so college students every summer um, that um, give their summer to spend in in mission for the summer. And the the kids that come, I mean, what's interesting to see is they 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 think okay, this is going to be a fun 
summer camp experience and like they maybe went to OMP as a camper and now they want to continue going to OMP um, and, and serve in a leadership role. And guys, the the most amazing thing is to see the kids, at the, the college students at the beginning of the summer and then at the end and we do an evaluation with each of them. And we've had people who have changed their um what they're majoring in in college and decided that they're going into full-time ministry, um, that they're you know going to, you know, even like go through the candidacy process to be a deacon or elder in the church. Um, one, one guy in particular, he, um, was in, uh, he was going to be a, a, a surgeon and he decided that because of his experience with OMP, that he wanted to change what medical field that he was going into and ended up going into pediatrics just because he enjoyed working with kids so much. Um, I, I truly think that the that OMP is one of the best places for the Methodist Church to um, end up having pastors come out of it because people come in wanting to do one thing and they come out deciding that they want to become a pastor just like y'all. Bailey, I don't really know, and I guess probably most people listening don't know. Why don't you tell us how did you first find OMP and a little bit about how it shaped your faith? It's actually funny story. So my, my husband grew up going to OMP and he um, grew up Methodist and I didn't. I grew up Presbyterian and um, always heard of OMP from my friends that um, that went to the Methodist here in Little Rock. And so I was at work working in politics before this and I got a phone call from, from a friend of mine that said, hey, I saw this job posting for Ozark Mission Project and I think you should apply. It sounds like it would be the perfect fit for you. And honestly, I was terrified because I'm not good at camping and I do nothing. And um, I've never worked um, in a faith-based uh, setting before. I mean, I, so I just thought there's just no way. Um, I interviewed for the position and it was at, uh, they uh, did the interviews at Lakewood United Methodist because at that time we didn't have an office. And I called my husband after the interview and I said to Will, I said, Will, I have fallen in love with OMP and I hope that I get this job. But if I get in because this is what God wants me to do, it's not going to be anything other than that, because I just didn't think that I was what they were looking for. And um, they called in the second round of interviews and ended up offering me the job. And I didn't know when they were asking me if I wanted to go to camp and be an adult camper. I thought that just meant that I'll take the kids to the job site and drop them off. <laughs> I didn't know that like a driver, adult camper meant right at the camp. Um, and I did it. And it literally, it, it changed my life. My camp experience um, has, it, it truly shaped who I am today as a person. You want me to tell you why? Sure. Yes. Yeah, that'd be awesome. So, um, I went to camp, and the first OMP camp I went to uh, was in Maumelle, First United Methodist Church in Maumelle, and our daughter was one, and I packed my air mattress, and I went to camp, and um, I slept on the floor in a Sunday school classroom, and we went out, and we worked for one of our, our neighbors, um, and the first day, we just we did some painting inside, and the last day of camp, we did what we call super, super a whole bunch of groups together to finish and we were painting a land in Maumel. And when I got there, uh, I thought there's no way we're going to And at the, the day, we finished painting our house. But what I really was talking to them is it wasn't about the house and it wasn't about the actual work we were doing. It was just about getting to know her and her love, meeting her where she is, just like Jesus does with all of us. And at the end of that day, for me, I, I realized very quickly that we cannot do anything on our own, um, and we rely on our own skills and our own talents to, to get through life. Like, Jesus has to be the center, and it was so uncomfortable. I mean, y'all, I was terrified being at camp and being with all these kids that I didn't know and um, not even being with my church home, and at the end of that week, for me, it was just opening eye-opening experience that we have to step out on things that make us comfortable and sometimes this, this things, just like asking someone how their day is or tell me about your grand grandchildren is what truly need. It's just the act. That's what I'm trying to say. It's not the act of building or that painting, the act of love and compassion and getting to know people. 
So I heard you mention that your first camp was Maumelle. Well, I served a church up in the Ozarks called Calico Rock, and we used to joke that uh, there weren't any Ozark Mission Project camps in the Ozarks. How do y'all select your camps? Well, our first camp actually was in the Ozarks, and that's how we got the name Ozark Mission Project. It was at um, Wayland Springs uh, Campground up there in the Ozarks. But we pick our um, camp locations, um, and we a, a couple of factors play into that. One is the need, the need of the community, um, and uh, the the number of like applications and projects that we think we can get um, based on our, our contacts that we have there and our church. But need is our number one priority. So some places we'll go to every year just because there's a huge um, need for us to be there. Like, you know, Central Arkansas, for example, Pine Bluff, um, West Memphis. Then there's other places um, like, you know, even Mariana that we have a relationship with the the church. Uh, One of the churches has asked if they could host OMP and partner with us and we feel like it will be a good fit for us and for the congregation and for the town. But anyone who is interested in hosting an OMP in your community, we have an application process and we just go from there. So this summer we're going to Malvern for the first time and um, they've asked for us to come for a while. And now we have enough campers to be able to add another camp. Um, we have 13 camps this summer. And so we're going to be able to go to Malvern. But we go where there's a need and um, where we can partner with a, a local church. 13 camps? Yes. That's incredible. Uh, wow. So tell me a little bit about the growth process for OMP because you started with one and mm-hmm. then now you have 13. So it's really grown over the years. And just what's gone into that? Sure. What's going into it is a lot of incredible volunteers that are dedicated to growing the church and making a difference in our state. Um, We're a volunteer-run organization. It started in 1986, and back then they just had one or two camps, and it literally it was just volunteers, all volunteers from from local churches that help put it on every year. And then in the early 2000s, um, decided that they needed to hire their uh, an executive director to help with. Uh, growing this ministry. And so um, they hired an amazing woman named Nancy Mulhern from um, Conway, First United Methodist Church. And she, under her leadership, we grew from not just using campsites, but um, going actually into churches and turning a church into a camp, which is absolutely incredible because there's um, an awesome thing that happens when you have church members that get behind what's happening in the church and what's happening in the community. So we, I mean, we just saw just exciting things happen with that model. And so when she retired in 2013, they hired me and we have expanded our ministry and not just our summer camps, but now we have a college ministry where we have college students that go on a mission trip every January. We've launched an elementary mission project called OMP 101, which is a day camp for um, students in fourth and fifth grade to learn about what it means to uh, serve your communi- community and what it means to um, be a, a, a disciple of Jesus and to do that every day, um, not not just with our words, but with our actions. I've experienced OP, and it's, it's a great, great uh, ministry, uh, and I highly recommend it for anyone. I imagine that you guys get calls from all over the country wanting to know uh, how they might be able to implement a, uh, a, a ministry similar to OMP. Uh, do any of those stand out in your mind at the moment? Not really, because when people say that they want to start something like OMP and they're in a different part of the state, like, I mean, say they're in the Appalachians, then, I mean, we are a part of an association called Reframe Association, which is a partnership of all camping ministries that are like OMP. So I always just send them um, to uh, what that is close to them. Like they have, they have this type, these type of camps in Colorado and um, Alabama, everywhere. So I always really do encourage people, like, let's not start all over. Um, try to find something that's working and, and partner with them. That's really cool. And I love how we can work together and cooperate. Yes. But, uh, but you let people like Bill come to your camp. 
So I'm sure you have some hilarious stories about construction projects going wrong. Yeah. <laughs> yes, we do. We do. Um, we we have uh, all I can say is with our construction projects that have gone wrong, we always make them right. So I need to just clarify that from the beginning. So if something didn't go well, we definitely send our A team in uh, to to make sure that that we um, fix the fix the situation for sure. But having kids do um, construction projects, I mean, there's there's a lot of things that can go wrong. We have more things that go right, but the ones that go wrong, it's neat to hear the kids talk about how um, they were so discouraged and they wanted to give up and they didn't think that it was going to be possible to finish. And then they do, they finish and it's a success story and the neighbor's happy and they're happy and um, it's a win-win for everyone. But those times, those uh, challenging moments, I, I think it actually kind of makes for the best long-term impact ever because the kids will use those situations and tell stories about them for years to come. So they're getting faith lessons and life lessons about perseverance and absolutely. And, and how to get along with people and how to work together as a team and how things don't always go your way. <laughs> so all these things happen in real life too. And it's great that they get to try it. Uh, how does getting kids like out of their normal setting change their perspective? Like if you lifted a kid out of Little Rock and took them to West Memphis, how does that change how they see the world? Well, I'll tell you a story about that. Um, this summer, a, um, a youth group from Little Rock went to Rogers and they were helping a couple and they were building a wheelchair ramp for them. And the uh, husband had just been diagnosed with brain cancer. Um, the wife, she was diabetic, and she had to get her leg amputated. So she was in a wheelchair. Their son, their only son, um, unfortunately died around Christmas time. Um, he was sick, and he ended up getting pneumonia, and um, they lost their son. And we were sitting in their house, which was you know less than like 800 square feet. It didn't have air conditioning. Their bathroom didn't have a, a door to get into the bathroom because they needed it um, easier for her to be able to get in with her wheelchair. And that husband and wife sat down with us. So it was about six of us sitting in their den and said, I want you to know that I have always had more than enough. God has always provided for me and we've always had more than what we needed. Always. And I saw the look on all these kids faces from upper middle class homes thinking, how can you say that you've always had enough when literally it's hot in your house, you don't have a door to your bathroom, you lost your only son, your leg was amputated, and your husband has brain cancer. And when we went back to camp and we actually got to unload that and, and process it during share time, the little boy from, from a, a youth group here in Little Rock stood up and said, I have more than enough and I've always wanted more. And my faith is just so little compared to hers. And I want to have faith like that lady. I want to have faith that I know that God always provides and there's always enough. And being able to see that firsthand in, in any child um, is incredible. But the, the kids at OMP, they come and they think that they are going to a mission trip and they're going to help other people, right? Like you hear that all the time. I'm going to go to Guatemala and we're going to do medical missions and we're going to help people build a C or I'm going to go to OMP and we're going to help people build to get out of their house. And what our kids realized when they left is that they received more from the families that we partnered with than they ever could have given them. Wow. Those are incredible stories and they come out of OMP all the time. And I think just about every kid would benefit from experiencing that. So mm -hmm. what do you tell a parent who is concerned about their kid going to OMP for the first time, especially those kids that are just coming out of sixth grade and, and uh, they're just now old enough for it. Do you ever have those conversations? Um, I do. And, and what I, what I tell any parent that is sending their kid to OMP is that when your kid comes to OMP, we are going to love them and we are going to care for them and we are going to protect them and we are going to spiritually pour into them just as if they were our own children. And we train our leadership volunteers and our college staff to to be their parents when when they when they trust their kids with us. And so 
the best part I think too for our parents is that they can they can call I mean kids some camps the kids the phones are taken away and we have found that that's really probably harder on the parents than the kids even though the kids are disconnected but they can actually call their kids and leave messages and their kids can call back at night after we get done with worship and share time they can see pictures of their children um, they can call their youth director and, and get to, you know, have updates daily on how um, their kid's doing. But I just tell them to, to trust us. We've been doing this since 1986, and we have parent after parent that can give you know, testimonials of how their kids' lives have been changed um, from this ministry. And if they're really worried about it, you know what I tell them? To co- go with them. We, we need adult volunteers all the time to come. They can cook. They can be in the kitchen. Or they can, um, you know, actually go out to a job site and have a family group. So there's a place for everyone. And we really want parent involvement. So we would love for them to come. Okay, I'm going to ask you a really hard question now, Bailey. Mm -hmm. Where's your favorite camp? Well, don't answer. Just don't answer. It's a trap. (laughs) You want me to tell you my favorite camp? I'll tell you. My favorite camp changes every single week. Because I get to go to all of them. I get to go to every camp and every community. And I get to see all of the youth groups um, and all of the churches. And so every week I have a new favorite. Um, And what makes it my favorite, it's not the campers that are there. And it's it's not even the church. What makes it my favorite is the neighbors that I get to meet. And every single week and every single time I meet a neighbor, that's my new favorite OMP experience. Because literally having neighbors thank you for doing your job, it's hard to take. Because I'm like, this isn't just a job for me. Like, this is a ministry. And it's, I mean, it's a calling. And um, it's so essential. Like, I mean, we should live like OMP every day and and always show love and kindness to um, our neighbors. We're all brothers and sisters. And so being able to meet um, new people, and um, sit in their house and break bread with them and drink lemonade or eat the fried chicken that they um, that they made for our family group that's there. That it that makes it my favorite camp. So every day during the summer is literally my favorite camp and my favorite day because it's so much fun meeting new people. Could you explain what a neighbor is for anybody that hasn't experienced OMP? Yes. So. If, if we weren't a faith-based organization, you would call someone that we um, do work for a client. But we feel like that we are all um, connected and we are all part of um, the body of Christ. And so the, the families that we partner with, we call them our neighbors. And our neighbors are anyone and everyone that we partner with during the summer. So it could be someone that we build a wheelchair ramp for, someone that we paint their house Methodist Family Health has been a neighbor before because we've done work um, at their at their children's center. So it's anyone that we partner with. And um, we what makes us unique, I think, is that the families that we partner with invite us into their home. So our, our group, one adult and four kids, will get to be with a, a neighbor for a day or even a week. And we have lunch with them every day. We pray with them if they want um, us to pray with them. We do a devotional and we have a theme. But in, the requirement to be a, a neighbor for us literally is that they that you have a need. That need could be emotional. It could be physical. It could be financial. But that you have a need and then we want to um, meet it. Do people ever do you keep in touch with any of your old neighbors or do you see neighbors again and again when you go to the same sites? Yes. So the, the neighbors love um, to get uh, the addresses of our campers and write them thank you notes. And they're like pen pals with them. And so um, that's been really cute to see. Obviously, we ask permission first um, before we, we give our campers neighbor our campers addresses out. But they'll send letters. And then when the campers will go back to like some of the churches will register for the same town. And so they'll go back to West Memphis like year after year and they'll stop by and they'll see the neighbors. But one of one of our neighbors, we we used to do a lot of work in Cabot. And um, y'all are probably familiar with the tornado that came through Bologna Cabot area like twice. I mean, came through once and then it came through again. um, I think it was maybe three or maybe four years ago. And uh, one of our neighbors called me to tell me that we had built her wheelchair ramp um, on her trailer and then the tornado came through and it blew it blew her her wheelchair ramp like off her house and 
She was telling me how awful it was. But our group actually came back and built it again. Like, I mean, she she got a new a new place to live and we built her another wheelchair ramp. And she called just randomly to thank me for us doing that because she was at home by herself and her son had gone to work and her trailer caught on fire. And because of the wheelchair ramp that our kids had built her, she was able to leave her home all by herself. And she just wanted to just thank me for um, for us being able to, I mean, her words were we like saved her life. And so I, I, I get to hear stories like that of like neighbors that just call to tell me thank you and situations that you and I like take for granted. But literally because we had a youth group that went and built a wheelchair ramp for that neighbor in Cabot, she's still alive. That's incredible. Yeah. I've gone to a couple of camps and I've never gotten a thank you note. Does that mean I've done a bad job every time I've gone to the camp? <laughs> well, maybe you focused more on the project than the relationship. The, the ones that like to sit inside all day and talk to the neighbors are the ones that get the thank you notes. So everyone has a skill. <laughs> so, yeah, some people love to just talk to the neighbor. Yeah. We had a great neighbor uh, in Bologna, actually. He was a uh, Native American that did chainsaw art, and we uh, rebuilt his fence for him, and that was just a great project. And one of the, the neatest things was when he came out and showed his art to our kids. Oh, wow. And the way they connected to him. I mean, he'd even done a, uh, a pirate ship at a chainsaw art and it was very detailed. I, I, I couldn't believe how that had, uh, how anybody could do that, uh, much less with the chainsaw. So right. I, I thank awesome. you for that experience. I've still got those pictures. Wow. That's awesome. That's cool. Hearing your stories, uh, it seems like a lot of people come thinking they're going to build something or do something, but the most important thing that's happening is they're getting to know people and, is changing their perspective and they're building relationships. Is that accurate? Yes. I mean, and they're growing in their faith. Yeah, that's accurate. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. That's cool. And I guess it catches them by surprise every year. They think I'm going to build a wheelchair ramp and they leave thinking, wow. Yeah. I mean, every year, I mean, kids just have story after story about, I mean, how walls were broken down. And I mean, the, the families that we partner with will tell them, you know, just about their life. And I mean, and then the kids, like our kids, our youth that register, I mean, then they, they're building relationships with, with youth from all over the state and they're opening up and they're sharing about their struggles and their successes and what they're going through in life. And you truly, when we say family group, um, it sounds cliche, but I mean, you really do become a family. Like my, my first family group, as I told you all about being there in Maumel, one of those kids in that family group ended up applying for college staff last year. And then he was on, he was on college staff. Uh, and it, just seeing the kids grow up and staying connected with your family group through social media. It, it, I, I love social media because we can all stay connected and you can see everyone grow up. And OMP really is like one big family. I mean, you You've met at OMP, you've connected through OMP, and that bond that you form in one week, it lasts a lifetime. My uh, first time at OMP, I uh, I just found out that one of the kids from that family group is now in the process of becoming a pastor. She is. Who is it? It is uh, Emily Autry. Yeah. And, yeah. And so what I want to ask is, is where did the concept or how did y'all come up with the concept of doing family groups because it is frightening to go to these camps and then all of a sudden be put into a group of people you've never met. Can you talk about the family groups a little bit? Yeah. So one of our founders is Alan Bruner and he, he um, passed away. He's from Conway. He was the, he was a children's, he had a long title, but he did a lot of stuff at First United Methodist in Conway and then Reverend Mark Lassiter was also one of our founders, and he's now a retired Methodist minister. And they felt like that it was really important to separate kids that all know each other. Like, you know, you can come as a youth group, but let's try to divide people up where they're with people who they don't know. Because they felt like that, you know, in order to see change and uh, effective things happen, 
you have to be able to communicate and work with people who you don't know. And so they, they, they understood the importance of that early on. And so they emphasized like, let's, let's take, let's take people out of their comfort zone and, and put them in a group of people who they don't know where they have to force really, you have to, you're forced to communicate. And, um, it, it, it worked. And now, I mean, we have some youth groups that are so large that they take up a whole camp. But the beauty of that is they're still being split up and they're not with their best friend and they're getting to know people in their own church and in their own youth group that they didn't even know before. Because we we tend to only want to hang out with people who we know and it's hard to it's hard to meet new people. So that's how that came about. And it's worked beautifully. And I'm just amazed at how well it works. In seminary, they did something similar to us, and it didn't always work. But in OMP, it seems like it always works. Well, it, with OMP, I believe that God truly has his hand on this ministry. And we have people who start praying for camp like before camp even happens. We have a prayer team that, that prays for OMP. And Everything that we do, we we measure it to our mission statement, which is to transform lives through worship, fellowship, and hands-on mission. And if it doesn't fit into that, we don't do it. And when we train our college staff and our leaders and everyone, I mean, we start with with the first thing you need to do when you wake up is you need to pray for this ministry and pray that God uses you as an instrument. Like it isn't about us. It isn't about the camp director or the college staff. It's about God. And so we always say, like, let's get out of the way. And when we when we take ourselves out of it and our egos out of it, amazing things happen at camp. It's it's awesome to see. Why don't you tell everybody some ways that we can find out more about OMP or if people want to support the ministry, things that they could do like to support it or get sure. involved or connected? We we offer scholarships to every single kid that goes to OMP. It really costs five hundred and forty four dollars a camper, but we charge two seventy five um, to come, and that helps cover all of our material cost and insurance and food and all of the things that we have to have in order to make camp happen. So a couple of ways that people can support OMP. Um, the the first way is just to you know pray for our ministry and pray for our church, and the second way um, would be you know financially, like going online to our website, which is ozarkmissionproject.org and giving $25, um, like helps buy paint. It helps, um, pay for our materials. It helps pay for food. I mean, any amount of money, uh, helps 87 cents of every dollar given to OMP goes directly to our programming. Um, and then if youth want to, to participate in our camps, just give us a call. Um, all of our information again is on our website. And we would love to have um, your kids come. And we, we we really would like to have all of the churches in Arkansas. I mean, I, I, I will be thrilled when every single um, church sends a group to OMP. We have so much room for for growth, um, but we can't we can't grow and help more communities until we have more campers that register. So that's the only thing that's holding us back. Um, we we have communities that want us. We have churches that want to partner with us, but we need more campers to be able to do that. That's really cool. And I know you do your camps. Uh, do you do any other things? Do you ever go out and like visit churches or what are other ways that you connect with, I guess, churches yeah. and communities? Um, I, I visit churches and, and speak to their youth groups and speak to their congregations about partnering with us. We work with area agencies to be able to find um, uh, our projects in each of our different communities. And so if anyone's listening and they're in one of our 13 different communities, which are all listed on our website, and they know people who could utilize a wheelchair ramp or um, any sort of minor repair work um, to send it, send them to us. And then Vacation Bible School is another way that um, we like to partner with the local church. We feel like just like with reading, the earlier we read to the to our children um, and teach them the importance of reading, the, the better readers that they will be. And I feel like that's the same with, you know, doing mission work and, and literally going outside of our church walls and, and doing what we've been commanded to do. So we Love to start with um, going to vacation Bible schools and talking about Ozark Mission Project to the little kids um, and getting their parents involved. And uh, we have we ask that people do different drives for us. Like we always need uh, paintbrushes and paint rollers. And so that's another another way to help. We really 
we just want to partner with the local church as much as possible to be able to have more campers come and more people wanting to go into seminary too, which happens with our college mission trip um, and our college uh, staff that attend. Bailey, if somebody has never attended a uh, OMP camp before, could you describe, I know there's no such thing as a truly typical day, but a typical day as best as you can. Yeah. So for new people who have never gone to OMP, First, I would tell you to don't anticipate. I mean, don't try to have everything planned out because it's not going to work out that way. Um, and to just trust that it, it's going to it's going to be OK. But when um, when you come to camp, the typical days you, we wake up, we um, eat breakfast, we have quiet time um, where we uh, do our devotional, which goes back to our camp theme every year. Then um, we go out, so it will be four kids and one adult. You'll go out to the job site, which is to someone's house we partnered with for the week. And we work hard, we play hard, we laugh, um, we work on our projects, and we um, eat lunch with our neighbor. Um, then we get cleaned up and shower and because uh, it's so hot. So we like you know have to have some downtime. Then we go back to the church and we have dinner and we do leadership building games and we have an amazing worship. There's nothing quite like OMP worship. Um, and we have share time, which is a time that you get to talk about what happened and, and how you saw God and how God used you um, in ways that you never imagined. And uh, then we go to sleep and we wake up and we do it again. And we have a night where all of the families that we've partnered with come and have dinner with us. Um, we, we do some really incredible things at camp. And so I, I would say to a first time camper, you, you'll, you'll love it. It's, it's, it's worth, it's worth spending a week with us. I promise. That's really awesome. Um, is there any new projects that OMP has in the works or anything that you want to plug or promote, I guess, beyond your camps and what you already have? Well, I would love to promote, and this will be the first time that I'm saying this out loud, um, in a public setting, we, uh, on Tuesday, on Giving Tuesday, um, Giving Tuesday is the Tuesday after Thanksgiving. We are doing a huge online um, donation uh, campaign on our Giving Tuesday. And if we raise $10,000 in that one day, um, Reverend Britt Scarda from Plasky Heights has agreed to kiss a pig. So he's going to go to the pig farm of one of our college staff, and he's going to kiss a pig if we hit $10,000. And to put that in perspective, we spent over $100,000 on materials um, this summer, and material costs have gone up. So raising $10,000 will be huge for us. It will help provide all of the materials for two camps. And he has agreed to kiss a pig. So I'm hoping that's the big thing that we have going on. That's the new big thing. Um, and I'm hoping that we can actually hit our goal and we can see him do that on social media. Oh, that's nothing, Bailey. I'll French a camel. Will you? Yes. Do you have a camel? You I know, know they have one at Heifer. Heifer's got one. Pastor Bill, I'm going to take you up on that offer. I'm going to take uh-huh. you up. So, so how about this? If we hit 10,000, Scarta will kiss that pig. And should we say if we hit 15,000, you'll kiss the camel? Yes. Yes. <laughs> I'm, okay. I'm good with it. I'm good with it. Okay. Well, then I'm uh, going to change our, our post to make sure it says that on Giving Tuesday because we 15000 in one day is going to be huge. And seeing you kiss a camel and him kiss a pig, I mean, that's priceless. Yeah. And if, if it, it's better, we've got an alligator farm in Hot Springs, and I'll kiss an alligator, whichever works better for you. Oh, well, the okay. alligator's closer to you there. Hmm. Mm. Well, we'll have to think about that one. Oh, well. That's the anticipation. It's anticipation. <laughs> Notice Jeremy didn't jump in there to say he'd kiss something. I know, Jeremy. Uh, no, but I'm going to write a check. <laughs> Good. Because <laughs> I want to see Britt and Bill kiss things. <laughs> okay. Well, and you don't need to write a check. You need to give it on Facebook on Giving Tuesday, the Tuesday after Thanksgiving, because we'll have a thermometer here and you'll just get to see the money go up and up and up. Oh, that'll be awesome. Uh, why don't you tell everyone where to find you on Facebook and social media so we can make sure that we hit our Giving Tuesday goal? Thanks. Yes. Facebook is just Ozark Mission Project. Website's OzarkMissionProject.org. Um, we're on Twitter and Instagram at Ozark Mission Project. And you can call our office um, if aren't on social media. And our office number is 501-664-3232. Thank you so much, Bailey. It has been an 
awesome time talking with you and learning more about the Ozark Mission Project. I know we have people in our church, even though we send youth every year, that still don't know what Ozark Mission Project is. And now I can point them to this podcast and say, the director of the Ozark Mission Project will explain it to you. Yeah. 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 Thank you again for doing this. And thanks for having me on your show. Yeah, thanks, Bailey. It was awesome.